And one of the reasons that I began collaborating with Eric was that we shared a common interest in the mechanisms and um, the control that allowed um, both the origin and the stability of what we, what paleontologists and evolutionary biologists have, have traditionally called um, body plans um, over the last um, 600 million years. Um, we haven't called them that for 600 million years. The body plans have been around for 600 million years. Um, this is, these are um, illustrations of some of the variety of things that we see in the Cambrian, some of them like Albuminia and Amlochris or ones that um, Ali told, talked to you about in her talk. And some of the others will come up uh, later on. This is a uh, diagram that we published in 2011. Uh, a lot of the data was collected by my students who I tweet. Uh, looking at the origin of phylum classes through um, the Ediacaran, the interval of time immediately before the Cambrian. Back here, you can see that the diversity of uh, Ediacaran organisms at the level of phylum and class is almost non existent. Um, but there's a very rapid appearance in the fossil record of, of taxa, particularly associated with these extraordinary faunas like the Bridge of Shale, which is this blip up here and the Chengjiang fauna in China, which occurs in stage three of the Cambrian. So much of the pattern of appearance of these things in the fossil record is controlled by some of these extraordinary faunas. Um, one of the um, statements that Eric used to make all the time is the following syllogism, um, which he concluded demonstrated the importance of GRNs Morphology is the product of development. Development is controlled by gene regulation. Therefore, evolutionary changes in morphology depend upon changes in developmental GRNs, um, full stop. Um, and that's, that's as fine as it goes, um, as far as it goes. The problem is that um, dealing with most evolutionary events in the history of life is a little bit more complicated. Um, and one of the things that that is not immediately apparent from um, some of the discussions we've had so far today is that focusing simply on gene regulatory networks provides a, really a limited view of the origin of a lot of these evolutionary novelties. And that's what I want to unpack today. So let me compare this view um, of Eric's with what's actually the standard view, I think, of most evolutionary theorists, which is that you really don't have to worry about the source of morphological novelties. It's nice to know mechanistically how gene regulatory networks evolve, but understanding them is not critical to understanding the novelties um, and innovations that occur in the history of life. The reason for that viewpoint is that most evolutionary biologists assume that the underlying dynamic is driven by adaptive radiations. This is a classic example from Hawaii. Um, there's this incredibly boring plant in coastal California called Colaquistia, which made it out to Hawaii, not via United Airlines, um, and diversified into a whole series of different things, from yuccas to, to uh, vines and trees and a variety of other things as well. So th this is one of the classic island adaptive radiations. The Hawaiian honey creepers are another example of the diversification of morphologies that you get. Um, when uh, single species wind up in places like Hawaii. And George Gaylord Simpson in 1960 argued on a broader scale, we now see, this almost sounds like Gould, but Gould sounds like Simpson. Um, on a broader scale, we now see even more clearly than Darwin did that every marked expanse from a group, whether it be a genus or a phylum or the whole animal kingdom, is an adaptive radiation. So Simpson, Simpson's argument, and it's the same argument that Meyer made, is that the history of life is really driven by adaptive radiations, and adaptive radiations are driven by ecological opportunity. So their fundamental argument is that to understand these events, the critical issue is not the supply of novel, novel morphologies, but rather their ecological success. If we understand ecological opportunity, we understand um, when these variants appear in the fossil record and the history of life more generally. 
that, that assumption, which I think is still central to much evolutionary theory, is what I want to attack today. Because I think one of the central messages from the work being done by most of the people in this room and the larger community outside of here is that we, in fact, have to re-examine and reject the claim that Meyer and Simpson made and look again at the supply of morphological variation. And we, that we can't assume that morphological variation will be supplied anytime ecological opportunity is around. Um, now, to make the point that I'm not caricaturing unfairly a lot of people, um, this is a paper published in uh, Biological Reviews earlier this year by Graham Budd and Soren Jensen on the Cambrian radiation, in which they take an explicitly adaptive radiation view of the event that we're describing. Their, Graham's view, very strongly held, is that the divergence of metazoa um, is basically captured fairly well by the fossil record that we see. Um, these are some ediacaran organisms back before the base of the Cambrian at 542. The divergence of most uh, metazoan groups occurs within um, the latest part of the Ediacaran immediately before the Cambrian radiation. So we have this conundrum. We have two di very different views of the importance of morphological novelty um, and developmental innovations versus ecological opportunity in generating um, these patterns. I think a key to understanding this is the common existence of what Dave Jablonski a couple of decades ago, and actually Dave Botcher, you were on that paper too, weren't you? Um, described as macroevolutionary lags. Macroevolutionary lags occur when there is a disjunction between the origin of a clade and its uh, evolutionary um, diversification or ecological success. In fact, these macroevolutionary lags, I think, are, are much more widespread um, than people tend to realize. They're, in fact, very important at the base of the Cambrian radiation. And I think molecular clock data allows us to reject the adaptive radiation argument that Graham Budd and others like Simon Cumnor and Morris have advanced. Um, this is from a paper, the uh, same paper we published in, in Science in 2011. It's a molecular clock study done by David, David A. Pisani, um, largely with Kevin Peterson. Uh, it's about 100 some odd taxa. The critical point here is that the divergence, the origin of metazoa by this molecular clock analysis is back about 750 million years ago. During the Ediacaran, we expect to see, although we do not in fact see in the fossil record, a large number of bilaterian clades. It's not, we don't see these groups until um, the Cambrian, which is the green um, rectangle you see there. So if we step through here, the, this is, um, these are some of the um, last occurrences based on fossil taxa um, of, of some of these clades. These are the clades that we expect to see in the Ediacaran, but are largely missing. Um, this is what, in a, in a way, Sarah just spent her last couple weeks up in Nevada looking for. Um, this is com combining the fossil and the molecular clock data. Now, there is a problem with the analysis that we published in, in 2011 that was pointed out in a very good paper um, late last year by Phil Donahue and Davide Pisani's group from, um, from Bristol, which is that the, these circles here are the fossil calibration points that were used in the 2011 paper. And the lack of, of sufficient calibrations in this part of the tree mean that while it turns out we can be relatively confident of the age of the root, we have much less confidence over the age of the branching patterns here. So there's, in fact, a lot of slop. There is some slop in these, in the estimates of these branching points. The question is whether that slop is sufficient to push everything up close to um, the Ediacaran, as Graham has suggested. Um, in fact, this has been looked at. This is a paper by uh, Mike Lee et al. from 2013, in which they looked at um, 
a variety of arthropod groups, um, similar to this, the study that Ali showed in her talk. Um, and they tried to look at more rapid rates of change. Um, and even if you crank up the rate of change, you violate the central assumption of molecular clock across the whole tree, you still don't get a pattern that's consistent with an adaptive radiation in the ED acronym. You still get a long lag. We're still missing 100, perhaps 150 million years of animal history before what we see at the, at the base of the Cambrian. And I think that's telling us something very critical about um, the linkages between the developmental evolution and what we see in the fossil record. So I, th I think, and this is a point that Graham and I argue about whenever we get together, I think, in fact, we can reject this adaptive radiation view. Um, and it supports or it suggests that what I think is a much more interesting view of the complexity of life. So this is what the tree would have to look like in order for Graham to be correct. Uh, the, this pattern of, of macroevolutionary lags is actually widespread. One of the best examples is actually the evolution of grasses. Turns out that grasses are not widespread until about 25 million years ago on the fossil record. They, by, based on molecular clock data, grasses evolved between 75 to 70 and 55 million years ago. So there's actually a long history of grasses before you see them ubiquitously as grasslands in the fossil record. Um, so one of the, the, the issues I want to address briefly um, here and then I'll come back to in a few moments in my talk is this, the issue of body plans. Um, body plans are something beloved by, uh, in a sense, a particular generation of evolutionary biologists and paleontologists. Now most of us are more concerned with the evolution of characters and character states rather than with the architecture of body plans. So we need that. One of the, the central themes of this talk is that we need to distinguish between the origin of body plans as a, as a suite of architectural characters of organisms. Some of them are, are synapomorphies. Some of them are, are new homologous states. Some of them are much more ancient characters. But they form sort of this bouillabaisse. base. We need to distinguish um, that feature from the origin of novel characters, which is, I think, the central contribution of developmental approaches. And novelty, um, as I will discuss in a few moments, is distinct from innovation. Innovation and novelty are not, in fact, the same thing. Joseph Schimpeter, who is my favorite economist of the last century, made this point in technological evolution in 1930. I think it's just as applicable to biology as it was to, as it is to economics. What do I mean by novelty? The term novelty is used by a, a large variety of evolutionary biologists. They mean very different things by it. Um, because novelty is in now, novelty often means whatever it is that I'm studying, um, because that increases the probability that I'm going to get funding. So the term novelty is used <coughs> in a variety of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> don't worry, Neil, nothing's going to happen. I'm still here. Um, the, the, the definition that I'm going to use actually comes from Gunter Wagner's recent book. <coughs> this is the most restrictive definition of novelty. There is a very good reason for using this definition which it, uh, is because it allows um, a much more rigorous comparison of different kinds of novelties um, in a variety of different clades. Most of the other definitions of novelty, w which often come down to just being some, any apomorphy, um, are so broad that it's very difficult to actually distinguish rigorously what novelty is and try and understand the mechanisms underlying it. In Gunther's definition, evolutionary novelty involves developmentally individuated and quasi-independent characters. So it, from a phylogenetic standpoint, he's looking at the evolution of new characters, not simply a variety of different character states of the same character. So if we think about feathers, 
um, a novelty is the origin of feathers themselves, not the whole variety of different feather types, which are different character states. So examples of morphological novelty would include things like feathers, um, these great pre-oral appendages of animal ocarids that Ali was talking about earlier, some of the features of this other great, wonderful bridge shale um, organism called herpetogaster, these things coming up off the one end of it. Um, we'll sort of skip that. So some of the other examples of, um, of one aspect of this um, that were identified by Gunter include the segment polarity network in Drosophila, eye development, um, and a variety of cell types, which I think Detlev may talk about in his talk tomorrow afternoon. In his book and in earlier papers, Gunther defined something he called chins or character homology identity networks. And Gunther ties the origin of novelties very closely to the origin of particular regulatory structures. As it happened, based on the work that Veronica did when she was in um, Eric's lab um, in uh, the early 2000s, um, the, what Gunther talks about as chins are topologically identical to what um, Eric and his collaborators described as kernels in 2006. Gunther was writing his papers at the same time, so this is a parallel identification of a similar pattern. This is the Cedarchin endomesoderm network. Um, the kernel that was identified in 2006 um, is this suite of genes here outlined in white. Um, they're recursively wired. Uh, Veronica showed that the same network has been preserved over 480, 500 million years between sea urchins and starfish. Um, other kernels were identified um, in this case, in heart development between flies and vertebrates, um, there's a, a fairly um, well conserved network of genes here. And the hypothesis was that um, key aspects of morphogenic patterning at the core of body plan development are underlain by these kernels. Um, but th th what's critical and distinguishes, I think, my view from Gunther's is that. Um, Gunther strongly argues, and he may, be, may in fact be correct, that these individuated novel characters are associated with these kernels or chins, that recursively wired networks are at the core of them. I, I would prefer to treat that as a hypothesis, that the, the origin of novelty are the individuated, developmentally individuated characters, and the hypothesis is that those are tied to particular gene regulatory structures. I think one of the challenges for this community going forward is in fact to test that hypothesis or to determine whether or not developmentally individuated novelties can be produced by other kinds of gene regulatory structures. So I would prefer to, to somewhat invert Gunther's approach and, and treat that as a hypothesis for future investigation. So the nature of kernels, um, and this has been described in a number of papers over the last 10 years, is that they're these recursively wired um, networks of genes that are dedicated to developmental patterning. Um, interestingly enough, one of the key differences, one of the key um, strengths of Gunther's approach is that he identified that many of these kernels, or chins as he called them, are associated with cell type um, specification and may occur more of the distal or peripheral parts of GRNs and don't have to be embedded within the core of the GRN as um, Eric and I suggested in papers in 2006 and 2009. Developmentally or evolutionarily, one of the fascinating things to me about kernels is that they suggest that once they evolve, they actually change the nature of selection so that selection acts upon the kernel as a whole it becomes what Peter Godfrey Smith would call um, a Darwinian individual, um, rather than the, the individual parts um, of the kernel. This is actually a slide that, that Sarah did that sort of merges um, the, the two approaches of chins and, and, um, and kernels. 
which suggests that character identity is associated with these chains and kernels. Positional inputs and localized downstream differentiation genes are what's responsible for other parts of the, the GRN, um, the character states of the character. So novelty lies up here. Adaptive change lies with positional inputs and localized differentiation. So the implication of this is, and this won't be surprising to, to any of you here, is that there's a structure to the, the network of developmental regulatory interactions. And part of what we have to understand in understanding how novelty arises is how the, the topology of changes to the network play out um, in an evolutionary sense. And this is a, a key theme in the last chapter of the book that, that uh, Isabel and Eric published last year. So one of the, the implications of this is that um, if kernels or chins do in fact exist, and if they are widespread at the core of different elements of a body plan, a body plan may not simply be a boolean base of characters, but there may be a developmental basis for defining things that Linnaeus and, and traditional taxonomists have recognized as things like phyla and superclasses and things like that. This is, in fact, exactly the conclusion that was reached in this paper in Nature by um, Levin that was published a month or so ago, in which they looked at this mid-developmental transition um, in a variety of different groups of metazoans. There are a number of issues that I, I have with the the paper, I'm not really sure that the data is strong enough to support the conclusion they reached, but the conclusion is interesting because they do suggest that there was a lot of variation um, between all of the 10 different clades that they identified, but there are similar patterns um, that suggest that, in fact, again, from a very different um, perspective, that there's a lot of com uh, there are common patterns within phyla but developmental differences between them that allow us to identify these clades. Um, now, let me come back um, toward the end to, to talking about this radiation of bioterians that we see in the fossil record. I'm going to assume, for the sake of the argument in the, the, the final few minutes here, that th th this lag, although probably not um, as severe as is suggested by this um, figure is still real. So there's still some period of tens to 100 million years of difference between the origin of the large body bilaterians that we see at the base of the Cambrian and the origin of the clades themselves. And the question is, what's driving that? Um, the, the hypothesis that Eric and I and others developed was that um, much of what's responsible for this is what is called or described as intercalary evolution of ge gene regulatory networks, so that the initial um, metazoan organisms 730 million years ago, say, um, had very simple networks like this with spatial and transcriptional domains inserted later between the differentiation gene batteries and the upstream um, regulatory machinery. So if we put this, these two um, ideas together, this would suggest that we can divide um, metazoan evolution into two different phases. A cryogenian to early ediacaran phase characterized by very small bodies with um, very simple um, developmental, development, ugh, excuse me, developmental patterning largely associated with a variety of cell type differentiation. And that's distinct from the co-option of morphogenetic pathways occurring independently in different clades um, during the Ediacaran and up into the Cambrian. So this model suggests that there's a great deal of independent intercalation of gene batteries to achieve spatial and temporal control um, after the origin of these clades. Um, the, the cell types, in contrast, 
much predate the morphogenetic patterning systems. Um, and that distinguishes between the novel, the origin of the clades and the origin of some of the novelties um, and the general patterning that we see. The, the key thing here is that the prediction is that there should be considerable parallel recruitment following the divergence of major clades. And I think much of the developmental, comparative developmental studies that have happened in the last 10 years largely confirm um, this conclusion or this prediction. So let me close with a couple of ideas about novelty and innovation. First of all, I think we need to distinguish between novelty and innovation. They're not the same thing. And I, that's what macroevolutionary lags are telling us. Novelty, as Gunter Wagner has, has argued, is the origin of these individuated morphological characters. The hypothesis, what, his hypothesis, which is consistent with the argument that Eric and I made, is that this is underlain by particular recursive structures of gene regulatory networks. But I think that's a hypothesis to be tested by future work. This tells us exactly what kinds of um, morphological attributes we need to understand the, the um, morphological patterning of. Innovation, and this is the, the issue that I, I don't have time to go into in detail here, innovation are the processes leading to ecological and evolutionary success. Those may be displaced by tens to hundreds of millions of years. There's one example that Steve Stanley published um, of a particular clade of lucinid bivalves which originated in the Ordovician and they do absolutely nothing for 400 million years until mangrove swamps evolve. It turns out that this group of lucinid bivalves was perfectly perfectly um, adapted to do very well in the um, anoxic muds of mangrove swamps, and they diversify wonderfully in the last 15 million years. The novelty in that case actually arose in the Ordovician. The innovation, the ecological success of the clade happened 15 to 20 million years ago. That, so this is a very different model of evolutionary dynamic from the one suggested by, um, by Simpson and Meyer. It suggests that adaptive radiation is real. I'm not dismissing um, the importance or the, the uh, significance as a research focus of adaptive radiation. What I'm suggesting, though, is that the diversity of evolutionary dynamics is much larger than simply describing everything as an adaptive radiation. So I can't go into this in much detail, but I just want to, to end by identifying what I see as a conceptual framework for looking at novelty and innovation. I'm not going to call this a model because to many of my friends at the Santa Fe Institute, a model is, involves formal math, and they don't like it if I pretend to do math. So I don't, because it usually ends badly. Um, so I see four phases of novelty and innovation. The first is the potentiation, which is both biological and environmental. Uh, the second is the origin of morphological novelties by specific developmental regulatory changes. Now, importantly, some of the potentiation, particularly the environmental potentiation, can have happen long after the novelties. They don't need to precede the novelty. That's what generates macroevolutionary lags. Those novelties are often, in fact, may perhaps always, refined by further downstream developmental um, and, in some cases, ecological changes. So ecological opportunity does not need to be directly tied to the origin of novelty. And then um, these novelties may or may not be realized as evolutionary innovations by ecological expansion and subsequent evolutionary success. In this model that I'm sketching out here, the origin of morphological novelties is not tied to ecological opportunity 
as suggested by Meyer and Simpson and many of their colleagues. I think most of what we've learned over the past 40 years suggests that a, a simple adaptive radiation model is really not applicable. And in fact, um, I think that's a much more interesting conclusion because that places a lot of emphasis on the importance of understanding the dynamic that actually generates the developmental variations that we see as morphological novelties. And I'll stop there. So we can go to lunch.